This video is about how are believers a spiritual temple for God. Hi, I'm Bake Adafi, and this is Bible Study Verse by Verse. If you'd open your Bible to the New Testament, to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, we'll begin in just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, How are believers a temple for God? Jesus is the foundation stone. Look at verse 4. It says, To whom? To Christ, coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen by God and precious. Here's the way to continue in holiness. Put away your sin, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Take in the word of God, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Now come to Jesus, the living stone. It's moved away from the food analogy and a hunger analogy to a building analogy. Come to Jesus. This is the present tense. This is a continual coming. Come equals salvation. Come equals pursuit of the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the foundation for your life. Our lives, for our lives as individuals and for the church as, as a whole. He was dead and now he's alive forevermore. There's four things to note about this. Jesus is alive and there's no other foundation for the church than him. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. There's no other foundation for your life. There's no other foundation for the church. Nothing else is going to stand the test of time. Nothing else will get you to God. Nothing else will please Him. Nothing else will, will make you so that you can stand before God. Isaiah 28, 16 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believes shall not make haste. Well, we don't talk like that anymore. Not make haste. It means you're not going to be put to shame. You're not going to be confounded. You won't. It won't be that it, it disappoints you. And, and, and you come up sh on the short end of the stick. That's not the way that it's going to work. The Father God has put Jesus in place, he, and he's a tried and precious stone. God did this on earth when Jesus had his ministry. He came to Jerusalem. He was rejected of men. He was despised. And the foundation for the church was laid on that cross when he died in the place of sinners. Uh, the substitutionary atonement, him taking the punishment that is due to us, us getting to go free from that punishment and getting his righteousness to boot. So that's the foundation. And then his uh, resurrection and then 40 days later, his ascension. That's where God laid the foundation for the church. The father put this thing in place. This is tried. They tried every which way to get him to sin and couldn't get him to do it. Find out any fault that he had, and there was none. He was precious, and he was sure, and God did this thing. And that's where we build our lives. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 25 says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, this is the Lord Jesus speaking, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Hear his words. Hear what he has to say. Do them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. That rock is the Lord Jesus. That's what this is talking about. He's the sure foundation stone. And the rains descended, verse 25, Matthew 7, and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. So, is your life founded upon the, the rock of the Lord Jesus? That's what this is talking about. God laid this foundation for us. It's the foundation for each of us, for our lives, and it's the foundation for the church. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20 says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. This is speaking to Gentile people. And this is how God has broken down the middle wall of partition between the Jews and the Gentiles. He's taken the law out of the way. And he's uh, punished the Lord Jesus for our sins. And of those two groups of people, he has brought them together as one group. 
as his church. It says, now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners. In other words, you're not cast out of the Jewish religion. That's not where you are. But fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And, built, and you're built, verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 2, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the apostles and prophets could, took the message about the Lord Jesus, which is the cornerstone for our faith and the cornerstone for the church. And they built that message and we have that recorded in the New Testament for us. We have the sure word about the Lord Jesus, and we have it in writing. That's why the, the Bible is so precious to Christians, so precious to us. Revelation 1, says, Jesus is this temple. Uh, this is uh, uh, the Apostle John, as he has this vision uh, uh, given to him by the Lord Jesus through an angel. I saw no temple there. He's talking about heaven. But the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. In heaven... The, the, you, we're with God. We're living stones in that temple that he's building in heaven. And, and he is the temple. We are there with him. We are part of his body. I mean, there's all kinds of illustrations that he uses. We're his bride. We're part of his body. We're, we're purchased together. Uh, we're a building. Uh, we're a temple for him. Uh, Peter quotes the Old Testament in 1 Peter 2.6. He says, Wherefore is contained in Scripture... Behold, I lay in Zion, that's Jerusalem, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He who believes on him will not be confounded. This is Isaiah 26 that we've quoted above. It's the same idea. The Lord Jesus is the foundation for the church, and we are being shaped as living stones within that temple. Second, the rejection of the Lord Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament. Here's a prophecy of it in Psalms 118, verse 22. It says, The stone with the builders refused. This is a thousand years before the time of Christ. I can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. A thousand years before Christ, here's the prophecy. This is the, these kind of prophecies are the ones that the Old Testament prophets tried to look into to find out who was this talking about and when he was going to come? <laughs> the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. <laughs> this is God's doing. This isn't any plan B or any... Nothing failed in God's plan. This was always the plan that he would be crucified and laid as the foundation stone for the church. Jesus quotes this prophecy and its fulfillment by the chief priests and the Pharisees. In Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures? You guys don't know your Bibles. You need to understand the scripture. The stone which the builders rejected, that's him. The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. This is the Lord who laid this foundation in Jerusalem at that time. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Yeah, it is marvelous in our eyes. God did this. Here's a prophecy 700 years before the time of Christ, along this same vein. In Isaiah 53, 3, he is despised, speaking of the Lord Jesus. If you know Isaiah 53, it is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus, about the Messiah, about how he was going to die, about all the circumstances surrounding it. 700 years before it happened, nobody heard, ever heard of crucifixion. It wasn't a manner of death that anybody put anybody to death to. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. That's the way they looked at the Lord Jesus. Because it's prophesied that that's the way that it should happen. 700 years before it did happen. John 1, 10 and 11 says, He was in the world, this is the Lord Jesus, this is the creator of everything. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Verse 11, he came to his own, and his own received him not. They, his own were the people of, of the Jews, the religious leaders, uh, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees. Those people hated him. They would not have him rule over them. 
in Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, it has this same idea. Be it known to you all, it says, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. They had, they had uh, performed a miracle and the man was healed. This is the stone, it says, which is set at naught of you builders. He was despised, he was rejected. They didn't, they didn't have anything to do with him, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation, you ought to memorize this, Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Then the rejected one, the Lord Jesus, despised, crucified. He's the, the foundation stone for the church. He's the one that God has set in place. Then thirdly, he's chosen and he's precious. Matthew understood Jesus' fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Matthew 12, verse 17 and 18. It says that it might be fulfilled. Matthew is basically writing to Jewish people, telling them all about how the prophecies from the Old Testament were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus and laying the foundation for them to believe that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, that's the Lord Jesus, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. Do you hear him, the Father speaking to the Son at his baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration? This is my Son, in whom I'm well pleased. I will put my Spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He is chosen by God, and he is precious to God. 1 Peter 1.20 says, He was foreordained to this, who verily, speaking of Christ, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest or made known in these last times for you. This is what the Lord Jesus was. He was rejected by men, but he was chosen and precious to God. And he is precious to us as believers. 1 Peter 2, 7, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But to them who are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed has become the head of the cornerstone. So there's no other foundation for our lives or for the church than the Lord Jesus. He was rejected of men, but he was promoted by God. This was all according to God's plan and God's prophecy. He was chosen by God. He is precious to God. And he is the foundation upon which we as Christians are living stones and being built up into a temple for God. Verse 5 says, You also as living stones are built up for a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are living stones in the temple of God. Our bodies are temples of God. That's in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It says, What? This is Paul's way of waking them up. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So individually, we don't do anything to hurt God's temple, and we are the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in us. God dwells in us. We belong to Him. He is fashioning us as stones for that temple in heaven. God lives in every believer and, and we are to glorify him. Together we are the temple of God. That's in Ephesians uh, 2, verse 20 and 22. We are the temple of God. We are a holy temple. You're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And we're a, we're a building fitly framed together, a holy temple of the Lord, a habitation of of God through the Spirit. Verse 5 says we are holy priests. We are royal priests. Not only are we the temple, but we're the priest. Every believer is a priest of God. It used to be there was one high priest and a bunch of priests in the Old Testament of the tribe of Levi. Now, everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ is a priest. 
We stand between God and men as ambassadors for God, and we proclaim the gospel to them by our lives and by the words that we speak. We are to speak the gospel to reconcile men to God. Revelation 1, 5, and 6 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, in other words, because he was raised again from the dead, we will be raised again from the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, that's the Lord Jesus, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and made us kings and priests unto God and to his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. We are made because we're bought by the Lord Jesus. We've been washed in his blood. He is the faithful witness. He has made us kings and priests to God. And we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Not animals anymore. Not real blood. But the way that we live in obedience to God is a spiritual sacrifice for him. From our hearts. Psalms 51, 17 says, The sacrifice of God, the sacrifices of God, that, that means the acceptable ones, the, God, the ones that God accepts, are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. O God, thou will not despise. Here's our spiritual sacrifices to God. We come to Him broken. We come to Him with a contrite heart and a broken spirit. And He fills us up with His spirit. And he changes us. That's what we bring. Brokenness. Contriteness. And he gives us soundness. And a, a clear mind. In order to serve him. And give the gospel to other people. Our bodies are a sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. I beseech you therefore brethren. By the mercies of God. That you present your bodies. A living sacrifice. So not a dead animal. Not the blood of animals but by the way that you live in obedience to him, in holiness. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, <laughs> obedience to his commands, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's just reasonable that you should do this because you've been born again. Here's how. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? You fill it up with God's word. You displace your sin with the word of God. You take it in. You get fat on the word of God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove, that is, live it out and show it by your life. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Living sacrifices, the words that we speak, uh, the, the attitude of our heart, brokenness, contriteness and the way that we live our lives we are to be um, living sacrifices for God not conformed to the world transformed by his word Hebrews talks about this idea of sacrifice when it says chapter 13 verse 15 by him by the Lord Jesus let us offer up the sacrifice of praise to God continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name do you realize how much you have to be thankful for to the Lord Jesus? We live and move and have our being in Him. All our blessings come from Him. Our food, our clothing, our money, our families, everything that we hold dear is channeled to us by God, and we are to be grateful for that. Praising Him for that. Being thankful, having a thankful heart. The griping and complaining that we do is replaced by being thankful and grateful for everything that God has done for us. And then notice in verse 5 that our sacrifices are acceptable to God. He accepts these things. Every good work we do is done in, as God's will. He works those things in us. He works them through the Lord Jesus. That which is pleasing in His sight. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 says, now the God of peace, who brought again from the dead the Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work, to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
God is at work in our lives. We are at work also. We cooperate with Him. We understand what His Word says. We pray for Him to make us hungry, that we might seek after Him. Pray that He might make us perfect. Might uh, Ephesians 2, uh, 8, 9, and 10 says, For by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Where do your good works come from? God pr provides those things for us. He ordains them that we should walk in them. But we have to do them. We have to walk in them in obedience. We have to fill our minds up with His Word. He works in us and we work to do things that are pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ. Last verse Hebrews 13, 16, but to do good and communicate, forget not, for which with for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Communicating the fruit of our lips, living a life that's pleasing to God, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, a broken spirit, a contrite heart. All these things are the sacrifices that we make in our lives as we are obedient to God and seeking after Him with our whole hearts with the power of the Holy Spirit within us, understanding what Jesus has done for us in forgiving our sins. And by this, we can be pleasing to God. Thanks for watching. I hope the Lord saves you as you commit yourself in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. I have hundreds of Bible teaching videos on my YouTube channel. You can click the red circle icon below to go there. Then you can click on the playlist and select the videos you'd like to watch. If you have questions or comments about this video, you can email me at all one word, Bible study, v by v at gmail.com. And please don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more Bible study, verse by verse.